time, the novel beginning. Um, I, I, my name's Roy Landor. Uh, I'm going to be operating as a kind of chairman of proceedings today. And uh, we've got quite a lot of ground to cover. Um, now, in this short introductory session, uh, I've got um, uh, three tasks, I think. Uh, I want to say a little bit about <coughs> the, the topic and the context and why it is today as it is. Uh, then maybe I'll go on and say something about the arrangements. Uh, and then um, it'll be my pleasure to introduce um, the speakers. It, can, <coughs> can you hear me all right here? We're quite small. Is it, is it, is it all right? All right. Um, <coughs> so, so first of all, just, just a little bit about um, how the meeting has come into being. Um, our subject, the individual uh, in an institutionalized world, is one with a, a very <coughs> large history of uh, past achievement. Uh, there have been um, so many um, very distinguished contributors um, going back to the Greeks, going back to Hobbes, who talked about things like states and individual relationships. Then there were people like Locke and Rousseau, who talked about individuals and powerful societies. Kant, Bentham, on problems of justice, and <coughs> Mill, and topics uh, such as his great <coughs> debates on freedom. Now, these people um, primarily addressed the individual in society with problems like state and the individual, problems like human rights and liberty, which I noted the other day, Alan Ryan in a recent article uh, was claiming to be almost too elusive uh, to mean anything very much at all. While these <coughs> individual state problems uh, continue to remain important and at times are responsible for at least uh, a very spectacular political set of controversies, they've come to be expressed other dimensions to the individual problem. With these wider terms of reference, it is not just the state that becomes a center of interest. Attention uh, gets widened to those perhaps lesser um, in magnitude um, forms which we talk about as organizations and institutions to which we, all of us, um, belong and which sometimes we might claim belong to us, but which certainly have quite a bearing on the events of our lives. Not only a bearing, but in fact uh, could be argued a very strong and by some positions almost a deterministic uh, relationship to much of what we do. Now, I don't wish to get into how deterministic or probabilistic it is, but clearly the bearing is very, very substantial. Now, <coughs> I don't feel that it's for me, um, as a, an introducer uh, and chairman of this meeting, to be attempting to um, establish definitions of organizations or institutions. Uh, people speaking today will no doubt have their own um, understandings of these and there will clearly be quite 
willing to describe to you what they have in mind. From my point of view, the <coughs> words we use to describe different forms of human grouping, whether organization, institution, or anything else, are quite unimportant. So long as we know, and this is the point I would like to make, so long as we know what each other mean by this. I have a personal uh, antipathy to, <coughs> to terrors of definition, so I won't bore you with that one. Um, <coughs> however, the organizations uh, which begin to interest us and appear to act as regulators to us turn out to be not just large government departments, strong medical services, or police forces, or British Leyland, or ICI, we find that there exists not just the large organizations, but an elaborate organizational fabric at every level starting with the family and going right up to the state, the super state, or even the international group. Lang tells us that the smallest of units, the family, is certainly highly influential, can be almost terroristic in its behaviors and he argues this is evidenced by many cases of schizophrenia which he has studied. It's thus then not only this large organization which should interest us. Even if for many people their frustrations very frequently appear to root from what appear to be, to them and to many of us, impersonalized and invisible and perhaps Kafkaish. Kafka clearly had this in mind, central and remotely controlled organizations. Unfortunately, <coughs> it will be very difficult to deny that dissatisfaction and anomalies between individuals and their organizations, especially their large organizations, appear to be coming increasingly conspicuous for more and more people over a wider and wider front. Uh, I would like to hear whether people would be able to support this. I clearly am not in a position to support it with any factual evidence. This brings me <coughs> to the framework of the conference. Uh, it must be clear to all of us that the topic is very large and the possible variety of conferences that could be held on this subject must be quite considerably large. But our program today has originated very much from two fairly simple to identify streams of concern. Uh, and I say this knowing that it's really much more complicated than this and that um, I don't think everyone would necessarily, who has taken part in this and who has even helped to organize this, would necessarily quite agree with this. But one of the streams comes from a built form, building, built environment interest, that set of interests. Several of us here uh, in the, among the contributors uh, are architects, where quite deeply concerned with problems of organizations. In fact, it's a central part of our interest. Now, the other mainstream comes from what may be called the social sciences, 
And I have to uh, say that with a great amount of trepidation, for it's a very dangerous term for the uninitiated to use. But this will include uh, all sorts of organizational concerns. I can't quite keep up with the various names that people call themselves now. Social ecologists, organizational psychiatrists, and psychologists, administrative theorists. I, I'm not very familiar with all of them, but I see a lot of them uh, appearing in new university departments and so on. Now, <coughs> our conference today has developed from the coming together of um, these people from different programs. Now, um, originally, uh, the connections were made for teaching and research. Uh, our own particular little interest, which perhaps initiated this, came from a <coughs> set of concerns which centered around um, various people in the Architectural Association who were interested in joining organizational problems together with architectural problems, but again, that's a horrible simplification and much too uh, elementary to uh, be able to uh, explain the possible wealth of the, these encounters. So, <coughs> if we can claim that our conference today then is about um, a set of concerns uh, bearing in mind its, its origin, I feel it, it might be something like this. We are concerned with what our organizations and the built environment do to those people within them and for those people within them, and last of all, what those people within them do to the organizations and to their built environment. So I'm just perhaps trying to define a frame of reference. Um, <coughs> now, accepting that our meeting, or in fact any meeting, must come uh, out of a particular and perhaps idiosyncratic set of concerns, is to be hoped and expected that today will trigger off questions and lines of thinking quite beyond the originally conceived of schema. This, this is to be hoped for <coughs> and can make our conference worthwhile. Um, I think I should like at this stage just to say, to thank Peter Cook and Artnet for not only um, allowing us to have our conference here but also for sponsoring our meeting. Now, I would like to say just a very, very quick word about the arrangements. Um, first of all, you'll, have you all got a, a, a program like this? Uh, you'll see that <coughs> both the morning and afternoon uh, sessions are divided into, first of all, presentations to the whole conference. <coughs> and then discussion groups. And at the discussion groups, um, conference members are asked to um, select one of them and to join them uh, and to discuss the topic uh, for the workshop period. We have asked um, some people uh, who, in the program we've... we've um, we've called opening responders uh, to get the discussion going and um, to perhaps just start things off in a positive way so that things perhaps to be responsible that they get started. Um, now, the only other thing I'd like to say is this. Um, the, we, we will, as you see, have these three groups um, in the morning and in the afternoon in these, these periods from 11.45 to 1 and from 4.15 to 5.30. Uh, we are suggesting that um, the, the people who are at the top of the list occupy this space, the people who are in the middle of the list occupy the space closer to the window, 
and that the people who are at the bottom of the list uh, occupy the, the, un, the, the basement space. If there's any uh, reason for wanting to change it, I think that's fine with us, but that's just our first start on it, and we, 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 we'll go on and arrange things as, as it seems fit from then on. Um, <clears throat> now, at the end of the day, between 5.30 and 6.30, we'll have a full conference discussion and accounts uh, from some of the participators in the discussion when we can hope to uh, join up with each other and join up some of the workshop sessions with a general session here. I think that's all I would like to say for now, except to say that it's um, my great pleasure to be able to introduce to you uh, Sir Geoffrey Vickers. Sir Geoffrey, <coughs> I think as many of you may know, um, is, a, is a writer, an organizational expert. He has been a, a lawyer. He has been an administrator. And <coughs> I think has been in one, in one of these very marvelous positions of having spent a great deal of time actually doing it. He came to theorize it about it rather later on. And his writings, I think, are very, very well known now to many of us. Uh, I, hope, I would hope to most of us. Um, and um, <coughs> I would think that uh, we would be very, very, uh, well, I'm sure we're very lucky to have Sir Geoffrey here. Uh, and, and I think that we, we would expect to um, have a very good introduction to our session since the individual in an institutionalized setting and the problems of advantages and disadvantages, which is a very suitable topic for setting us off today, happens to be one of the subjects which I think Sir Geoffrey has written about and feels very strongly about <coughs> and, and has um, said very much about in, the, in, in his uh, writing. So could I please uh, introduce Sir Geoffrey and say how pleased we are to have him with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lando. Um, I think that uh, four things need to be said, <coughs> unpleasant as some of them may seem, at the beginning of a conference like this. Uh, the first is that one of the very few things we can say with any assurance about human beings generally, uh, <coughs> now or in Mesolithic times, here or in Asia, um, is that they are all social animals born into an institutional setting. That is as true of a Marian tribe in New Guinea as it's true of us today. And they would not have survived otherwise. The individual does not exist until he has been differentiated out of a society by the same process that has socialized him in. The family itself is not a strong enough unit to survive. The traditional pattern that's kept our species alive for more than 99% of its time on Earth uh, is a loosely connected group of families regulating their affairs just large enough uh, to overcome the ups and downs of collective life and browsing on the tips of innumerable food chains. Uh, there is therefore nothing odd, whatever, about living in an institutional world. And the second, I think, equally unescapable conclusion is that all forms of organization both enable and constrain. Uh, and you can't have the enablements, even the enablements that keep you alive, uh, without the constraints. Uh, the constraints are of two kinds, one of which is the obvious one, that you can't do everything. Uh, and even if nature has endowed you <coughs> both to lead Manchester United and to be uh, Premier of this country, you couldn't in fact do both. Uh, so the constraints of life, of human, individual human commitment uh, uh, themselves uh, impose the constraints corresponding to the enablements that those personal commitments claim. And the other thing of course is that any position from which you can do anything carries with it responsibilities as well as rights 
and these responsibilities constrain as well as enable. <coughs> and number three uh, is that whether you regard and feel your institutional setting as a const primarily a constraint or primarily an enablement depends, I think, by and large, much more on you than on the way the thing is organized. That is not, of course, universally true. History is dotted with the example of oppressive institutions which have been made less so. Ivan Illich thinks he can distinguish between uh, institutions which are manipulative, uh, uh, like multinational corporations and schools, which ought all to be abolished, and uh, institutions which are convivial, like the telephone, which ought to be by all means encouraged and made free, because they enable people to enjoy each other without telling them what to do. Ivan Illich is a man of such stunning um, I intelligence and human sympathy that it is uh, hard to question uh, what he says. Uh, and yet I, I feel... I, I, uh, uh, it's very hard to believe um, that he really thinks that as clearly as he says it. Uh, because at every turn you find in any institution uh, that it is both and it very often can't be one without the other. Uh, very, uh, Ivan Illich, no doubt, would have learned to read and write whether anybody made him or not. Uh, but an awful lot of children wouldn't. And insofar as they are coerced into learning to read, they are being manipulated. At the same time, they are made free of the immense conviviality of being able to share the thoughts of, of the whole of recorded mankind. So these two things are really very intimately mixed. And although I do not believe that except in very extreme cases, you can distinguish between a manipulative institution and a convivial one, I do believe that Elisha's two characteristics, which are uh, the restraints and the enablements I've referred to, which are the bonds and the bondage that I've referred to in a, a chapter of a book which is extracted in this, uh, in this paper that some of you have read, is a very useful uh, distinction. But I think it would be uh, illusory to suppose, particularly today, that if anybody feels uh, that his institutional commitments are bondages rather than bonds, the answer must be to do something to the institution. There is no doubt that the attitude of mind of the, of the individual component is just as important. And the fourth thing, which I think is, you'll find much more controversial, is that we are less constrained and more factually enabled than any people in this country have ever been and than anyone in this world is now, with the possible exception of a few European countries that have done, done the job better than we. Uh, if you think, let alone uh, other countries, if you think of our ancestors in this country looking in on this meeting, uh, the megalith builders of 50 centuries ago, the people of these parts who cleared the dense oak forests of the Thames Valley to let the Roman roads go through, the, 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 uh, the feudal lords as well as, the, as well as their serfs of feudal days, the Londoners who walked up to Tyburn to see first Protestants and then Catholics burned and went over London Bridge to see the dissevered head of the last magnate who fell foul of the Tudors. <coughs> Colonel Rainsborough telling his fellow MPs in Cromwell's day, the poorest he that is in England hath a life to live as the greatest he. People in the next century are disturbed to find there was a Dutch fleet in the Medway. Blackton in the 18th century describing English laws having being the evolution of a legal process so perfect that no further improvement could be expected, and Hogarth at the same time drawing the other side of the picture. 
so on through the 19th century, through Beveridge and the years after the war uh, to now. All these antisers are looking on this, in on this conference, open-eyed with surprise, surprise, saying, what are you bellyaching about? Uh, we have known oppressive organizations and tried to make them less oppressive. We have known corrupt institutions and tried to make them less corrupt. We have known incompetent institutions, uh, uh, like, our, uh, like uh, the one that lets the Dutch fleet come up the midway, and we have learned uh, to make them more competent. Uh, we know we have, uh, for many, many centuries, been trying to improve our institutions. But the idea of bellyaching about an institutional world as such is wholly new to us. I say, from the megalith builders up to Beverly, I believe this idea would be most puzzling. And yet, here we are. So, all I'm pleading is not that we shouldn't be here, but that we should not assume that we all know why we are here. If we all start off assuming that being institutionalized is obviously a bad thing, and we know how bad it is, and we've, we've come to think how to make it a bit better, then I think we shall miss the whole point of this meeting. Uh, the things that we are pinpointing, the things that Roy Lando mentioned, for instance, he wasn't inveighing about oppressive organizations, about incompetent organizations, about corrupt organizations. The only thing he did mention was an oppressive built environment, which is hardly, uh, in one sense, an institutional function uh, at all although institutions are deeply involved in trying to make it a more human place to live in. Now, the built environment we live in is an incomparably better one than that which was destroyed in the Great Fire of London in 1660. But at that time, nobody thought it was anybody's business to see that that environment wasn't lousy. So people lived in it not perhaps without complaint, but regarding it as almost as much an act of God as the weather. Uh, whereas today, <coughs> if there's a bit of paper lying about in the street, you blame not the chap who dropped it, but the people that the council has failed to pick it up. So part of the trouble clearly is that our standards of what to expect of our institutions uh, have greatly changed. Now, at this point, of course, we run into a trouble which becomes mentally intolerable the more conscious you are of the immense variety of institutions uh, that there are to talk about. Uh, and um, even what I have <coughs> said for the moment will already shows uh, a bias, a sense of escalating expectations of the public institutions of the country within which we live. That may not be uh, the whole background to our uneasiness. We all know that the international institutions of the world um, are breaking down politically, not perhaps to an unparalleled, so an unparalleled scale, but on a scale which matters in a quite unparalleled way to us. I was reading a little time ago the diary of, Diaries of Kilbert, uh, an English clergyman who lived a hundred years ago in a Welsh parish, and at one point he records as a matter of interest that uh, the news, amongst other items, records the fact that a war has just broken out between France and Germany. And this was indeed a, a matter of sufficient interest to attract public attention for some weeks. I mean, it made no difference to us. It was their affair. Now, uh, today, a civil disturbance in Angola, uh, let alone the Near East, let, uh, uh, let alone Beirut, let alone Ulster, uh, has all of us deeply uneasy, and for good reason. So, there is a background there. 
And this background is being sharpened uh, by what looks like a recrudescence of the old battle for resources, which has characterized this world throughout its recorded history, and which was only put to sleep for a happy century uh, by the commercial and industrial explosion of the 19th century. The present troubles between Britain and Iceland, which are relatively minor only because Iceland isn't large enough to defend its fisheries with force, uh, is a symptom of uh, a coming clash for resources which provides a very uneasy background to everybody's mind. Uh, and if anybody was aware of the situation in which they live, a sense of nat national unease would of course be equally uh, persistent. I find it quite in quite possible to understand the difference between personal and collective ethos in this matter. Uh, we live in a small and grossly overpopulated island which imports nearly half its food and more than half of the materials that it uses to make the stuff it buys the rest of the food with. Uh, we keep it going by borrowing largely abroad at such a rate uh, that the escalation of the interest we owe on the money we've borrowed already becomes almost more than we can borrow again. Uh, and everybody is enormously surprised, enormously surprised, that uh, an increasing burden uh, of debt borrowed to balance a budget should make that, balance, that budget less balanceable in the future rather than more. If a schoolboy knows better, the folk expressing this indignation know better, but they simply do not connect uh, their understanding of ins and outs uh, with the national system of which they form part. And for that there is strong historical reason, not only through the 19th century, which most of them are too old to remember, but, but not too old to escape the inheritance of, but even in the curious uh, history uh, since the war. It only takes about 10 years of a trend to form a habit. <coughs> so it may be that part of our reason why we're here is a general sense of institutions being <coughs> inadequate. Then there is the familiar unease about institutions being too large. Well, insofar as we're talking about political institutions, institutions they're no larger uh, than they have been for the past couple of hundred years and uh, may well soon be smaller. Uh, though it is true that at the level that affects people, they are large and have grown larger. Uh, this may have an effect in the public sector uh, the only New England, New England is a, uh, an American state which is wholly divided into townships, each of which still has a town meeting which decides collectively how to spend its money. The only one I know well, a place of 20 to 30,000 people a little out, way outside Cambridge, uh, decided that it didn't want to afford to have what they call its trash collected. Instead, every householder <coughs> takes his trash to the local dump and personally sorts the glass into four categories so it can be sold and stacks the paper in the appropriate way so that it can be sold and the recycling of glass and paper is considerable help to the local revenue. It is also contrary to law to make a bonfire in your garden, so anything you can't compost, you also take and to the town dump that it may be destroyed there. Now everybody in this, when I ask my hostess there if this is the same all over New England, she says she hasn't the slightest idea and she obviously doesn't care either. That's the way we do it in Wellesley. Now, where you can have political institutions of that kind, you manifestly have a very different picture. And it is true that ours have 
past that size and that the last reorganization took them further past that size. But even before that, uh, the kind of urban and rural councils and boroughs that we had before 1974 were still on a scale so much above that of Wellesley Mass uh, that I doubt if this size factor really matters. And when I look through my own experience, I've worked in large organizations and as well as small ones, in public ones as well as private ones, I have, and at the bottom as well as the top, and I've never been personally oppressed by this feeling of size. Uh, there is a large literature about this in, <coughs> in business management, and it's got important things to say, uh, but my impression is <coughs> that the organization at the size at which organizations feel human is itself so small uh, that if you can get it right at that level, you're all right, however large the top hamper may be. So I don't think any of us should assume <coughs> uh, that uh, everything's too big anyway. Lots of things are too big. And if you wish specifically to study the pros and cons of multinational corporations, of the EEC, uh, of this and that, then that is a perfectly valid thing to think about. All I'm asking is that we shouldn't just make general assumptions about size <coughs> as if they were material uh, to the anxieties which have brought us here. Because although they're not absolutely irrelevant, I don't believe, I don't believe they're central. Well, is it that these institutions are more and more inhuman? Uh, I don't think so. It's true that the more rational management gets, the more inhuman it gets, in a way. On the other hand, certainly business management, and to some extent public management too, is incomparably more aware today that it is providing a social milieu in which people live, as well as a service, than ever it was before. The literature of human relations in business goes back from Mary Parker, Parker Folly to what about 70 years ago through Elton Mayo to the Trists and Amory's of today and it's not only in the writers on the subject but in the general basis of understanding. Uh, it is true that change sometimes leaves organizations uh, inappropriately shaped and they have to be reshaped but I'm not satisfied that that is a uh, uh, a general as distinct from a specific cause. The only cultural revolution I ever took part in uh, began on November the 12th 1918 which was the day after the signing of the armistice which concluded the first war when an eerie silence that could be felt fell from the North Sea to the Swiss border and on that morning the regular divisional commander of the division with which I was serving called his battalion commanders together and said uh, uh, you may have observed that the object of this exercise has changed <laughs> Please be aware that whereas yesterday you were commanders of fighting forces fighting a war, you are today uh, the administrators of large bodies of potential civilians who have to pass as usefully and profitably as they can the time between now and their final dispersal, which will probably take six months. You should therefore organize them at once in Soviets, as the Russians have just done. Uh, the Soviet re the revolution, remember, was 1917. The word, we were just learning this new word. It was 12 months old. He said, I can't think how they fight a war that way, but it's obviously a swell way to do a demobilization. Of <laughs> uh, course, your, <coughs> your existing organization will serve for administrative purposes, uh, but all the real doings will soon be quite differently organized. Cause your people to... Um, 
organize themselves and get together and make lists of their interests and skills and organize <coughs> an adult education activity uh, which will keep them going. And if the sanitary corporal is the best chess player in the place, he's the man to run the chess club. And if the adjutant's keen chess player, you can probably find something to learn from him. And this will not in any way erode his authority as adjutant. Uh, but please be aware that there are two matters of discipline which are extremely important. The first is you must get these folk to understand why. A volunteer with a wife and children at home who's been out here four years should wait while a young man who's been out here one year returns to resume his studies uh, because there's lots of room in universities for people to resume their studies but the company which has promised to restore this man to the job he had four years ago is still reshaping itself and out of getting it out of his war habit into his peace habit and it may be three or four months because his job's ready for him. Now uh, this is understandable but hard to unbelieve and you've got to get these chaps to understand it. And the second is, please remember <coughs> that your French ho the French hosts on, in whose houses and barns we have been billeted, across whose fields we have been trampling for four years, uh, will find it much less agreeable to entertain for another six months large masses of idle armed aliens than they did uh, when these chaps were fighting to push the Germans out of their country. So a very much increased sensitivity uh, <coughs> to the needs and feelings and interests and wishes of your French hosts uh, is required. They are now not liberatees but hosts. So to that extent your chaps must understand that whereas all other forms of military discipline are now completely relaxed, that one's very tight. <coughs> I have always, this is what, 50, God knows, 55 years ago, uh, but I always remembered with great admiration the um, first particularity of this regular soldier trained in the days of the Raj, a typical, you'd think, British officer, who immediately perceived what was required and immediately laid it on. And it worked like a charm. Looking back, I can remember not only no trouble, but even no anxiety uh, during those long though and rather tedious months of a French winter. So problems of reshaping can occur. And when they are dramatic like that, it may be they're easier than when they're gradual. But once again, I do not believe that you can pin down to some inhumanity, certainly not to any increasing inhumanity, on the part of organizations, public or private, the sense of unease that's brought us here. You may perhaps again pin it to escalating expectations on the part of those who are affected, but that brings me back to where I was before. You may find that those expectations require still further changes, yes indeed. And once again, if we were concretely studying this company, that department, we would undoubtedly find things we could suggest which would make a difference. And some of them might be as obvious as the changes that my dear General Campbell suggested in 1918. But don't let's get sidetracked onto them too much because I don't believe that's really at the root of the general anxiety <coughs> that brings us here. Well then, what is it? Is it that there are not demanding enough? Well, uh, I'm probably the only person in this room who can clearly remember uh, the debates on the Beveridge Plan in 4550. And I can't remember, though I got w indirectly with great force from reading the reports, the dynamics that drove that in the generation behind my own. The immense dynamism to get rid forever of the idea of pauperism. Uh, to establish rights as a citizen that were rights and not given out of charity or by a leave. And they were extended to everybody by as a birthright. This was a noble aspiration and led to, uh, I think was far the most integrated body of social legislation this country has ever passed and with certainly with the least uh, partisan or other dissent. It may be that this uh, 
well as a uh, well motivated move has again helped to create that dissociation of right and responsibility that makes us uneasy. Or is it perhaps that institutions now don't be too demanding because if they d were, they would be too conflicting? I never worked this. Can someone tell me how to switch it off? I'll stop in a minute, but I want just... What do I draw with? No, no. Thank you very much. Here is your tribal organization. <coughs> the nice, tidy, hard edge between us and them. And here is an individual who has a strong family nexus. And probably a not quite so strong peer group nexus and possibly uh, an occupational nexus and who himself progresses through levels of this hierarchy which I can't describe as he as time turns him you just, you just thank you as time turns him from infant to elder but that is about it <coughs> this is an institutionalized world all right perhaps by our standards too much so. I remember an anthropologist from West Africa at some conference exploding and saying in some connection, but until the last generation it was unthinkable for an African to take a personal decision. Now, uh, it was in the course of a dialogue, it was a slightly exaggerated statement, one knew exactly what he meant, that people in this sort of a world don't uh, and need it. Now, No, I want to turn it round. Oh, <coughs> what happened today <coughs> is your individual with a very much smaller family nexus, with layers of uh, local authority uh, belongings, or rather administrative authorities, which increasingly lack the sense of belonging uh, which was visible in my tribal picture. The man has an occupational nexus which comes right out here and may or may not claim much of him. He belongs to a union or a club or a professional society and that claims quite a bit of him. He may have <coughs> other interests which wholly absorb him and unite him with people all over the world who are interested in stamp collecting or revolution or what have you. Uh, <laughs> when you come to this person, uh, uh, how much of him is comprised in any of these? And how could he support his membership of any of them if he belonged too much to any one of them? Uh, the job of managing multiple memberships is certainly one of the jobs that we have bought by creating the kind of institutionalized world that we have got. Not the degree, because as I say, these early worlds were institutionalized all right. But it was a simple and a rigid organization. Ours is not. Uh, and with that change has come enormous benefits we would be sorry to get away from. The fact remains that the personal demands on the individual to organize his belongings so that he can do what it takes to sustain the manifold systems of which he is part and still retain this central system which is him is the cardinal problem of our time. And when you find devi deviations going on, however wild, you will usually find the cause in the overriding need of the individual to protect somehow this inner, uh, inner citadel of integrity, even if it means making this perimeter between us and them the narrow circle of me rather than the large circle of the tribe. And those, I think, are really the issues we've come here to talk about. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm.
Thank you, Sir Geoffrey. Um, we're now <coughs> going to come to our next speaker. I, I, I'm going to try and keep our meeting on time, if possible. Uh, we're going to, I think, tie in at this stage the concept of the size uh, of the institution with one particular uh, area, one topic, uh, the problem of housing. Um, John Turner, uh, who is our next speaker, I think was trained as an architect. Um, he has worked um, in South America on housing problems. He has worked in research in housing, uh, the Joint Center of Urban Studies between MIT and Harvard. He is presently at the, uh, in London and, and, and is in, teaches uh, in the graduate school at the AA and in the development planning unit. Uh, and um, his, his subject is the sort of what sort of organizations uh, will be needed for uh, housing in the future. Uh, thank you, John. I was very much hoping that Sir Geoffrey would continue, believe me, of this very difficult task of following on. Uh, <coughs> um, I've written this, and I'd better not depart too much from the text, but, uh, you know, I really, and I'm not too sure whether this reinforces and matches what Sir Geoffrey was saying, or whether it raises other issues, but maybe in the discussions is overcome clear. It gives so much to think about, but I can't, unfortunately, as I go along, adjust as I should uh, what I've written here to uh, the bombardment of wisdom that he's just uh, treated us to. Um, well, as Roy said, my talk's about housing, and from my point of view, it is therefore about two very different things. For some, housing is a service, a necessary convenience that can easily become a great nuisance. For others, it is an activity. For them, it's an important part of their lives, uh, a vehicle as well as a container for personal and family life by virtue of the responsibilities it demands and the creative opportunities it provides. But I'm, I'm making no judgments. I'm not indulging in self-criticism or criticizing the millions who treat housing as a service voluntarily as I do and who are willing to pay the real costs of the benefits that this privilege exacts. But I am questioning systems that impose housing as a service, however. I give seven reasons why housing cannot be provided as a service by large organizations or institutions anyway uh, <coughs> at prices people can afford or that society can afford to pay on their behalf. The same seven reasons also explain why housing as an activity is an impossibility in heteronymous or centrally administered supply systems. These seven reasons why heteronymous housing or centrally administered housing is a luxury that even rich countries cannot afford to offer everyone uh, support and extend the central proposition that my friends and I set out in our book, Freedom to Build. Uh, a lot of you have heard this before. I'm sorry I keep repeating it. It's kind of favorite paragraph. <laughs> when dwellers control the major decisions and are free to make their own contributions in the design, construction, or management of their housing, both this process and the environment produced stimulate individual and social well-being. When people have no control over nor responsibility for key decisions in the housing process, on the other hand, dwelling environments may instead become a barrier to personal fulfillment and a burden on the economy. The only addition that I'm making to this proposition is that housing as a service and product of heteronomy will be a barrier to personal fulfillment and a burden on the economy, wherever it is either imposed or whether costs are too great for the household to bear voluntarily. Housing, then, may be no more than an adjunct to the household's activities, or it may be an intrinsic part of those activities. 
Although difficult to describe in a few words, everyone knows the different relationship that one may have with one's house. In some situations, it's no more than a necessity, most conveniently supplied by non-interfering landlords or agencies that let one use it as one wishes, but which are also responsible for rates or taxes and for maintenance and repairs. On the other hand, one's housing may become a part of one's life and a vehicle for the satisfaction of one's remoter needs as well as an immediate necessity. And by remoter needs, uh, I use the phrase of, of Edward Sapiers, an anthropologist writing in the 1920s, made a very clear and I think very important distinction between kind of the immediate ends and the remoter ends of life, remoter ends very briefly being the kind of cultural ends that Maslow, the kind of higher needs as it were, the more complex needs that Maslow refers to. Anyway, um, a family's house and home is often their pride and joy, or their principal pride and joy, in which they lavish great care, in which they invest a great deal of their savings. Whether done in a commercial spirit of financial investment, or in the spirit of the creative artist, or a mixture of both of these and other motives, housing is obviously, or as often perhaps I should say, far more than a material necessity and a convenience best decided and provided by others. The vital differences are those of responsibility and costs. When one's situation and priorities are such that one's housing is a matter of convenience, rather than an object of primary concern or a vehicle for the realization of one's material or metaphysical hopes, the less responsibility it demands, the better. There are costs involved in the transfer of housing responsibility to others, however. One must either pay more or someone else must do so on one's own behalf, usually in the form of subsidies. Or otherwise, one must accept poorer conditions. Many people in secure and creative employments prefer to pay higher rates to be free to concentrate their energies on their work, for instance, than to spend the time and energy buying, building, or managing and maintaining their own housing. And in planned and mixed economies, Many get some of both benefits, although I believe that progressively less, or the progressively less of those services are escalating social costs, and for the seven reasons that, that, that I'll be coming to shortly. This basic division of housing as a service, commercially or institutionally supplied, and housing as a personal and local activity, reflects different sets of priorities. Now, here I'm going to make some rather uh, enigmatic references to work that uh, Thomas Sudra, a friend of mine, have been doing lately in Mexico, which is development of work that I was doing some years before in Peru. And uh, in the 10 minutes or so that I have, I don't really have time to go into that. So I'm afraid you'll have to, to live with, perhaps with, with, with this with rather, rather, rather brief and <coughs> unexplained references. Um, however, we have come to the conclusion, or Thomas Sudra really has refined and developed ideas that, 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 that uh, or formulations that I came to myself from my own experience in Peru. Uh, in the case of Mexico, we've been working for the past five years, um, that the, he's identified the most common priorities of, of low-income housing in terms of those who seek the use of a dwelling only and those who seek both the use and unlimited occupancy, generally identified with ownership in that particular context, as also in our own. Owner-occupiers' motives are for the non-dwelling as well as the dwelling use. It's used for the acquisition of financial or social status or security, for creativity, self-confidence, the education of children, and so on. There are an awful lot of reasons, I think. Continuity of tenure, is of course essential in most cases in order to achieve or to satisfy these demands. In most, quote, free market, unquote, contexts, this is synonymous with owner occupancy if properties are new or recently established. Uh, <clears throat> this is, we derive from our in-depth case studies uh, we did of households, uh, situations and experience during their lifetimes or, 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 or during 
their memories and their parents' memories. Uh, and uh, Thomas Sudra uh, lists the common prior most common priorities, or two sets of very common priorities, should I say, uh, <coughs> are, are these two uh, sets uh, of uses, or two particular cases, uh, uh, as follows. Uh, those, or many of those, particularly the poorest, we, and we happen to be concentrating on low-income housing in that context, who seek uh, domestic use of the dwelling only, their priorities are, are frequently for minimizing the cost of living, for very close access or direct access, close proximity to sources of the livelihood, access and proximity to their peers or relatives, and the freedom to move at short notice. Uh, <clears throat> I think that those priorities are probably familiar to many people who know of or who uh, So the, the set uh, starts with a commonly overlooked fact, I believe it's a fact, hinted at in references that are just made to those detailed observations in Peru and Mexico, and that is that personal and household priorities for housing are as variable as their changing life situations. That is, effective housing demands are immensely variable, immensely variable, and can never be fully matched by a standardized supply. The common error of housing policy makers and of, housing, of the housing problems industry in general uh, is to suppose that housing means houses, or just the components of the built environment. Of course, it means far more than that. In warm climates, anyway, location and tenure are evidently more important than physical shelter components for very large numbers of people, and especially for those who use housing as an activity as well as a convenience. It is a vehicle for reaching the remoter cultural ends of life. So uh, the first reason, then, to repeat that the personal and household priorities for housing are as variable as personal and changing life situations. In other words, they're infinitely variable. The second reason is that personal will and effort depends on experienced or expected consequences. As coercion is costly, I'm referring mainly to anticipated satisfactions, resulting from voluntary action rather than the fears or fears of the consequences of failing to obey orders. This means that in a voluntary and therefore potentially economic housing system, there must be an adequate match between the procedures, goods and services supplied or obtained, and the priorities and effective demands of the users. Because, as I said, personal will and effort depends on experienced or expected consequences. Or, if you like, satisfactions, if one emphasizes the positive side. But I think it's very important, just parenthetically, to recognize that consequences can be neg negative, or uh, that is, you do something because not doing it will result in, 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 a, in, in a great deal of pain, as well as <coughs> doing something because doing it results in a certain amount of satisfaction. And that has that side to it, obviously, as well. And there's a third fact, what I believe to be a fact which reinforces the second one, is that personal tolerance for the consequences of decisions made is directly proportional to the participation in and responsibility for those decisions and their consequences. Now, this is what I have called the gift horse factor in current book, Housing by People, which is being published in Cedula in, 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 in AD, Architectural Design. Colin Ward, who, who who was embarrassingly generous with his quotations, has himself observed the increasingly disturbing and disconcerting differences between the often deteriorated condition of well-built council housing in Britain and public housing elsewhere, and the generally excellent condition of jelly-built houses of similar age. And I <coughs> will relate this back to, the, to this notion of personal tolerance for the consequences of decisions made is directly proportional to their participation in and responsibility for those decisions and their consequences. The next two reasons concern the nature of large organizations and institutions that supply personal goods and services, not large organizations and institutions in general. I don't think that I have, I have much difficulty, if any difficulty, with what Sir Jeffrey was saying. 
be interesting to see whether he has difficulty with what I'm saying. Uh, anyway, the fourth fact I claim is that the, the larger the organization, the greater the economic demands of its scale for procedural and productive standardization. Anyway, when we're referring to housing, I wouldn't necessarily claim this is true in every field, but in housing, I believe, I'm prepared to defend this. Uh, the larger, I repeat that, the larger the organization, the greater the economic demands of its scale for procedural and productive standardization, the standardization of its products and the way in which it produces those products. And the fifth reason why these organizations cannot provide economic or socially viable dwelling environments is the fact that large organizations prefer useful machines to useful people. Schumacher quoted an early mark, the early Marx as saying that the more useful machines there are, the more useless people there will be. A fact that we're at least at last, I think, coming to realize in you know, what's kind of an analogy of the black death, or black death of human skills and creativity. Um, <clears throat> and for these last two reasons, why large organizations are inappropriate for housing, or as I say, or I suspect, uh, uh, and, and along with uh, Illich and many others, for any existentially relevant service or activity, and here perhaps we would have some discussion, I have to do with resources and their availability. This is a point you made, which, which, I, which I, I, I think, I hope, I'm reflecting here, and I think this is extremely important, perhaps the most important of all, that short-term housing costs or capital costs are functions of the ratios between plentiful and renewable resources and scarce non-renewable resources when, most importantly, when externalities are accounted for. It's a little bit dense, this, I'm afraid. It's getting very dense. But but sh what I say to give the short-term housing costs, or the capital, the first costs of, of building a house, or building, providing housing services, are functions of the ratio between plentiful and renewable resources, and scarce non-renewable resources, when all the externalities are taken into account. By externalities, uh, I mean, well, the cost of pollution, uh, the costs that we don't actually pay for, that other people pay for in the short or the longer run. But, as already observed, large organizations find it, quotes, uneconomic to use variable resources, especially if they tend to be scattered in small local quantities. By economic or efficient, they mean profitable, of course, or if non-commercial, just politically powerful and manipulative. In a nutshell, the larger the organization, the more impervious it becomes to personal inputs and the use of plentiful and renewable resources. So finally, or and finally, I, well, maybe I should add to that, I mean, the, the, con, the, 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 the converse is, or the corollary is obvious, uh, <coughs> the larger the organization, the more it becomes dependent on scarce and non-renewable resources, the more it excludes the use of local, personal, and renewable resources, the more it becomes dependent on fossil fuel resources, and so the vicious circle builds up. Uh, 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 Okay, the final and seventh reason, and I'll, I'll finish here, uh, even a little bit before time. Um, even when housing is supplied by large organizations, long-term costs or costs in use depend on personal care. But, of course, users will not care for goods or services that fail to match their priorities and are therefore burdens and barriers to the realization of their hopes. It is already noted, the threshold at which mismatches are perceived and felt depend very much on who has made the decisions in the first place. Uh, <coughs> well, I'm afraid that was very dense. Um, but I hope you can follow it. <coughs> Thank you very much, John. Um, now, we have a presentation. It's, it's just, just occurred to me that, that it's as much an institutional presentation as it is a presentation, since it's an institution, a little newly formed institutional group that is presenting um, I believe that 
institutional groups that present, although this isn't a, a well-known phenomenon, do have difficulties in organizing. Um, and I don't imagine that this particular group has had so, but it is one of the rules of organizations that they do have to work together with some sort of goal. And so it may be interesting to hear uh, our, our three presenters who, who come from this rather crossover area, um, Tom Gilmore, who is here from the Management and Behavioral Science Center at the University of Pennsylvania, who was a, an architect um, uh, <coughs> and moved into, um, moved into management science. I, I think he, he, he still has connections with architecture and is in fact teaching at an architecture school now, so we've actually brought him back into architecture. <coughs> um, Richard Jones is at Tavistock Institute. Uh, he comes out of psychiatry uh, and is now a researcher. Uh, Adrian Node is at the Institute for Operational Research in Coventry. <coughs> Um, has recently joined it and returned very, very recently from America where he also was at the University of Pennsylvania. And they have, in fact, got a, a short presentation which I'm biting into, um, three of them in the next half an hour, which they have called Who Am I, Who Are We, and Who Are They? Um, I don't think that there's any need to say anything about that because uh, it's going to be very interesting how it evolves. But uh, I believe Richard is, Richard Jones is open to this. Richard. Um, well, I'm confused at the moment. I, <laughs> actually, I was on the point of resigning a little while ago after having heard the first two people. But I think. Um, that my sense of confusion and disorganization has, uh, has increased since uh, hearing the first two talks. And in a way, I suppose, some of that's what this is about, which is how do we deal with the confusion and the uh, seeming disarray and uncertainty which the present environment faces us with? Um, <laughs> Tom was talking in my ears as uh, Geoffrey was talking, and he was saying, things like, um, God, he's good. How can we follow that? And uh, then he actually said at the end, you know, he stole it all out talk. And that was really why we are going to resign. But I think actually there's something in the fact that he stole it all out talk. Because at the end, what he was talking about was something about, as I understood it, how do you get a sense of belonging? Um, how do you meet the various personal demands which are made in you in our present institutionalized world? And how do you maintain a sense of integrity and a sense of internal understanding and coherence in the present institutionalized world? And I think that that's really what we're on about. I might say that even having sort of got to that point, I'm, I'm still uh, confused and uncertain and somewhat anxious about continuing. But I think that um, what I want to start and finish with are two quotations. And really, whatever else I say is in a sense gratuitous to, to those things. Now, um, I, my, my task right now is to really simply to introduce um, Tom and Adrian, who've got quite a lot of things to say about this particular title, which I suppose has also got the quality of being a parable, as are the things that I want to read out. So if I could just start with the first, and I'm going to finish with another. And I think that what, what these are about um, are that they are things which made sense to us and to me, to which I, I see a sort of meaning um, from in relation to individuals in an institutional world, but also in a way which I, I think that the, the hope is that, that they will stimulate um, people here, but in a different sort of way, and that we can some some ways uh, share this. The by uh, George Louis Borges, who's an Argentinian poet, and the first one is from an exchange of letters between one of his... Uh, editors and translators, Anthony Kerrigan, and says this, through the years, a man peoples a space with images of provinces, kingdoms, mountains, bays, ships, 
islands, fishes, rooms, tools, stars, horses and people. Shortly before his death, he discovers that the patient labyrinth of lines which traces the image of his, traces the image of his own face. That now, what's this title about? I think that uh, what it's about is the experience of I-ness or me-ness or you-ness and how does one get to that experience or how does one establish that sense in the present world. Uh, if one was to give, this, give it the appropriate social science title, I suppose we'd be talking about the establishment and maintaining of a sense of identity in an institutionalized world. Now, how we got to this was that when we came with what we thought was a, um, a reasonably coherent and well-defined task to do something about this, as Roy says, we very rapidly discovered that we were an institution, that we'd in a sense been thrown together. We've never, we've never actually worked together, although we knew each other beforehand. Um, slightly, anyway. Uh, that we couldn't simply write down the things which we shared, that we couldn't come to this, even though there was, we very quickly got the idea that we did share some things. We actually had to do a hell of a lot of work at coming together as a group. And that some of this work was about who were we as individuals in this particular group of three. And then we thought about, we thought, well, this is the sort of thing that we're constantly confronted with, so why don't we try and explore that? And what's more, why don't we try and really reflect on what our experience has been in, in doing this, because perhaps it's common, perhaps it's something which other people might be experiencing when they're here, or indeed in other institutions. Now, I think the, the things that I want to say very quickly are what were the things which we shared, what were the things that we had in common. But I think the first thing, um, I'm confused, my notes have got out of order. The first thing was that we shared certain assumptions, certain theoretical assumptions, and I think that, um, the first one was this, the notion of being uh, contextualists, uh, in that we, th we think of outcomes as being co-produced by systems and environments, and that uh, one can only understand phenomena and social behavior in terms of both uh, the experience of the thing which you're examining and the, experiencing, uh, the experience of the environment in which it's located. I think the second assumption which we shared was that there's that well, what we're concerned with in our work, in one way or another, whether it be with individuals, families, or organizations, is achieving a capacity for active adaptation um, to complexity, uh, uncertainty, interdependence, and so on. That is, that what we're concerned with is much more concerned with uh, processes rather than plans, as Trist says. That is the development of capability. The, the third thing, and I think this is where the crunch comes, and this is what we really had to spend a lot of time doing, and I th actually I think we thought it was quite valuable on the end, although it was a hell of a hard work, was that something about the, the, the value which we held was around what Fred Emery calls the life principle, in terms of, which is that design of organizations is based on the redundancy of functions rather than the redundancy of parts and that the notion of building up um, capacity for active adaptation is by elaborating internal controls rather than external controls. And why I said the crunch comes here, I think it's to do with two things. One is the notion of shared values, and the other is the notion of something which is internal, and which is felt and experienced as being internal. And this is actually where I don't, I'd like to, to ask Sir Geoffrey afterwards, which is what I thought he was getting down to at the very end, which is what are those things which we hold, are, which are internal to ourselves, which we're able through some series of processes to be able to share with others in a meaningful way. And I think that what we sort of got to was that, that this, this notion of internal creates a hell of a lot of difficulty because we looked at various papers and so on, and I can remember Tom saying about some of these, but they're all lies. Those people don't act like that. They don't do things like that. And I thought, my God, he's right, but they make a hell of a lot of sense. I like the theory that's there. But there's some sort of gap between the theory and the concepts and the, the, thing, the behavior of the person that's writing it, the things which are being done. And I suppose that my feeling, and I don't know whether the others share this, is that there's something about 
whether the, the, the thing which is being written about, the thing which is being done is internalised. And I think that was the work we did, and this is what uh, Tom and Adrian are going to go on and talk about, giving some really examples of their experience in work settings. Um, now, if I could just talk a bit about, and I suppose I'm really positing beliefs in a way, uh, as to what I mean by internal and what, why it's important to me, is that I, sp I think the best way I could describe it is something which came to me this morning, um, in that I, I was supposed to go home last night and try and do something on this, and in fact two reprobates took me drinking, and so I didn't get to do it until this morning, but there was something in that, because what I woke up uh, remembering was a quotation from Sartre, which actually I can't remember where it, where, remember where it comes from, but it says, Hell is the other. From Incamera. Um, hmm? From Incamera Right, well... <laughs> and I don't agree with that. And I think that this is it. <laughs> but I agree with part of it. I agree with a quarter of it. And this is really what I mean by this whole thing about internal and why it's important. Is that I, I came up with a thing called the Hell Ecstasy Continuum. Because I don't think Hell is the other. I also think Ecstasy is the other. And I think it's somewhere along that continuum, that is the taking in of both parts of that, that you achieve this sense of internal and integrity and consistency. But it's not just about the other, it's also hell is the self. And I'd go on and say I think also ecstasy is the self. And it's by the somehow uh, taking in and carrying out and acting of the hell ecstasy continuum that one gets a sense of being able to both individually and in terms of the things which one encounters, the institution that one encounters, achieve this notion of um, active adaptation. Now, what um, I think you're going to find is that in different sorts of ways there's going to be uh, reflections of, the, of personal statements and personal experiences but what underlies some of that is the experience that we had of trying to see what sort of shared value the, that the three of us had in trying to get to be able to present something here. <coughs> Adrian. I'd like to move from the discussion so much of the internal to the external, to the boundaries that separate us, boundaries that separate each of us from institutions, from each other here today. I think it's very important to remember that these boundaries are invented by ourselves, that they're not imposed on us. They're things that we can redefine if we want to. And I think that one, one of the troubles today is that we forget this, that we feel we have to accept boundaries as they are. The example that I, that I would like to use <coughs> to illustrate this concerns citizen participation. Planners, I think, in the past um, have tended to be isolated from us. There's the ritual of, of the technique, the ritual of the professionalism, have separated them. Um, <coughs> I'm not saying that this is the fault of planners. Or, or the fault of us. It's just that we didn't understand the boundaries that separated us. Now, there's been a lot of protest against planning and against planners. People have sat down in streets, people have sat down in front of bulldozers, people have picketed power stations. Politicians have tried to ignore planners. Politicians and the public have got together in some instances to go around planners. And planners have become worried. There's this process of the redefining of boundaries, that information has traveled through these boundaries, and these people are concerned and have thought, well, how can we redefine our boundaries so that we can expand outwards? So the stimulus has come from, from inside planners for citizen participation, from governments. They have said, we want to, to bring this protest within us. We want to go outside. I'd like to, to share some experience with, with attempting this idea, the idea of the institution expanding its boundaries to the individual that I have had. 
to pick up uh, an area where Sir Geoffrey Vickers mentioned, uh, New England, which is a very, a very beautiful state, um, a manageable state. It's not what we would call turbulent. It's not what we would call large. It's somewhere where people can relate to each other. And in the state of Vermont, there was a statute, a process of arriving at a statute for land use planning. And this was used in an experiment by the federal government to try out some ideas of citizen participation, where the institution itself said, we want citizens to cooperate, we want citizens to participate. A lot of money was, was invested in this project. And I was involved with it for about two years. We used cable television, we used telecommunications, we used questionnaires. We did everything that we thought people wanted. We did everything that we thought would involve people in the process. Vast amounts of data were generated. Vast amounts of data came back to us. And what happened? The policy elite set their networks of friends of friends into action. And they manipulated the data. They used the data to force through their own ideas, which may or may not have related to citizens in general. But the point is, it didn't work. The final plan was written by one man, one man who had a network of friends who he could manipulate bureaucrats, Republicans, and Democrats alike, who was trusted by all of them. In this country, We've seen structure planning process recently introduced. Again, there's an element of citizen participation where the institution is saying, we want to go out and involve people. We want them to work with us. The result is that instead of one plan, two or three along a narrow consensus are being given to citizens to vote between them. One local authority, I understand, actually used a public relations firm to, to present its, its ideas on planning, its ideas on what the choices should be. Is this participation, is what I would question. In Canada, neighborhood planning offices have been set up so that the bureaucrat is no longer faceless. He sits in an office waiting for people to participate. But is there anybody for him to write to in the community? Is there any chief executive in the community for him to talk to? And if there is, it becomes a community organization. It becomes another boundary that isolates itself from the other individuals in the community. And again, the individuals have to cross another boundary. In a way, what I'm, what I'm saying is echoing Sir Geoffrey Vickers. The institutional change, the institution going out into the community, going out to try to bring people in, is not working in terms of resolving this boundary conflict, in terms of, of increasing participation and motivation. I believe that it's not inside institutions that we have to change. It's that we have to change ourselves as individuals. Where did the environmental movement begin? It was with Rachel Carson and a few individuals. Where did the women's movement begin? Betty Friedan and a few individuals. And they learned how to manipulate an interdependent world. We are more enabled to manipulate and influence our world outside than we have ever been before. So I think it is wrong to wait for the institution to come to you because it's not going to work. Thank you. I'd like to uh, pick up where Adrian left off with some personal reflections really about uh, being effective uh, on the margins of institutions, in the interstices, uh, working that particular uh, seam 
uh, really from uh, two perspectives. One is being intellectually interested in the phenomenon and studying the behavior of people who are good at putting coalitions together, uh, making things change, uh, linking institutions such that they uh, have within the temporarily created system enough richness to encompass the particular issues they're regulating. And the second uh, level of reflection is very much a personal one in the sense that Sir Jeffrey posed the questions, are institutions manipulative, are institutions adequate? And what I increasingly find myself asking uh, in my own professional behavior, am I adequate, am I manipulative, and you know, what is the way I'm operating, what are the lines between uh, the ways in which one puts various things together? I think this is particularly important because uh, Trist and others ha have really argued that these processes that are taking place in the ground, uh, really outside of the institutional boundaries, are really far more important than what's going on inside of institutions. Uh, Shown certainly talks of the network manager operating on the periphery, on the margins, uh, linking different relevant organizations together, organizations which themselves are not able to come together in more formal kinds of means. And, and certainly, uh, friend Powell and Yellett have talked of the phrase, the reticulist, uh, who is able to match the, an appreciation of the structure of problems with the institutional maps that are somehow necessary to be brought together to uh, bring about solutions. So in some sense, I'm troubled because all of these writers tell me that these people are critically important as to whether we're going to survive or not. And yet, I have some uh, reservations, really, from observations about my own behavior, about, uh, uh, about this, these questions of belonging and, and uh, manipulation. You know, working through, Adrian told me something I hadn't realized, that reticulous came from the Roman gladiatorial notions of a man with a trident in the net against the person with a shield and a, and a sword. And in some sense, you have the caricature of the bureaucrat, organizational man, against the reticulous, the one agile, the one sluggish, the one uh, having mobility, being responsive, and the other more plodding and less uh, able to cope, et cetera, but perhaps stronger, perhaps uh, standing for something like that. And I think in some sense we've, we've, uh, we have this kind of uh, simplistic dichotomy of, of network, uh, loose, uh, fast-changing, self-organizing, and bureaucracy, sluggish, bad, etc. And, and these, these, these kinds of mappings are always dangerous, I think, because when we tend to focus on what's bad in a present situation, we look at the change agendas of making that different, good, in the future. We tend to ignore the, the maintenance agendas of, of really looking at what's valuable in the present and maintaining that, cherishing it, furthering it. I think we similarly tend to uh, miss the unintended consequences of, of uh, our interventions. The, the things that start out being good and through our own uh, processes end up being less good in some kinds of ways. And this, this notion of, of, of the dichotomy of the good, bad, the, the, the bureaucrat, the anti-bureaucrat, I remember coming to it with uh, one uh, state of developed set of ideas in reading a book by Victor Nevesti called Kennedy Justice, which is a lovely account of Robert Kennedy's tenure in the Justice Department. And it's very much set up as a comparison between the way in which Robert Kennedy operated, cutting across organizations, dipping right down across levels to, to relate to line people, and the way J. Edgar Hoover related very much to the bureaucrat, leaving the written trail, covering his tracks uh, very much through kinds of channels. And at that time, long before many of the subsequent contaminating revelations, you know, that, that, that was a nice kind of framework, but again, reality seems to confound our desire to make those kinds of things uh, uh, simple, and, uh, uh, and we see that, that it's really a far more complicated phenomenon. So I'd like just to take several uh, minutes to look at two questions about sort of operating in this multi-organizational context, really operating in the environment that Sir Jeffrey sketched for us with all these, these kinds of poles. And they're, they're very kinds of personal dilemmas. I think the first is this question of problems of identity and loyalty. Uh, the degree to which one, this loss of, of, of certain primary relations that orders the world and answers questions, who am I, et cetera. I find that 
of reading some of, say, Argerus' stuff about the individual and the formal organization, it almost has an antique quality to it, in that, that the relationships are now so much more complicated than the relationship between uh, the individual and his work life. It's the individual and all these many other tugs and pulls that are really far more difficult to balance. And what I personally experience is, is uh, almost too much an ability to take on the characteristics of the different organizational settings that one's in that you begin to wonder uh, uh, where's the me and where's the other directed parts of me that is responsive to the different uh, context that I'm in. I think the second feature that, that concerns me about the operations and behaviors of the reticulist are these notions about the, uh, uh, the ability to be manipulative. Uh, Irving Goffman in, in Asylums talks about one of the characteristic features of the total institution is this loss of control over who knows what about you. There's this contamination of realm in some sense. At the other end of the extreme, in the kind of network context, you, you may have the other problem that you have excessive control over who knows what about you. That you're, you become actually different to different people, a chameleon. Uh, we talked in our meetings as to whether this Vermont lawyer, to what degree could that person be effective if forced to operate in the public realm, where, in which he had to present behaviors that could be observed by his multiple constituencies? Would his abilities to knit coalitions together fall away, be exposed, if it will, that because, because of this lack of any core uh, of what he was about and, and, and what he was getting? So one sees, you know, I certainly see personally in, in my own organizational operations as one uh, that works with many different settings, the selective disclosure of information, not only about oneself, but about what one has found out, of using information gained in one of those little relationships in another context without the initial person knowing in what ways that information was used. So in, in some sense, I end with a, some notion of a personal dilemma is you know, my ability often to be able to see the world through the eyes of the people I happen to be relating to at that particular point a value that, that enables one to uh, bring together groups and capabilities that, that somehow can't talk to one another? Or is it something that's a, a failing on my own part to answer those questions about who am I and what is my identity and what do I stand for and what are the kinds of things that motivate me? And at the second level, this issue about manipulation, I ask the question, you know, am I a steersman in Eric Trist's uh, uh, terms, you know, forming networks and inducing learning in the social structure, operating in the ground? Or am I rather uh, manipulative and uh, piecing together kinds of things and bringing together those bits of systems around a set of very personal kinds of uh, values and goals and what I think is important? I thought it was intriguing that Adrian really used the word manipulation in two radically different senses, the one talking in a negative sense about the Vermont lawyer, the other in, in, a, in a positive context about, uh, about Nader and, uh, and whatever. Uh, and, and in some sense, uh, I, William Irwin Thompson did a, a piece about uh, people like Nader. It was a lovely article called The Individual as an Institution. And he's asking, he's, he's saying that we're, at least in America, unable to understand a Nader, uh, an Illich, a Soleri, these kinds of individuals who have authority but no power. And in our typical American way, we want Nader to run for president or Nader to be a senator or Illich to come back and accept a chair at a major university. And, and he asked this question about, you know, what are the consequences of joining in some sense to their effectiveness? And, and I guess that's the question that I want to end on is uh, in my own sense of, of the dilemma, as I think Sir Jeffrey put it at a seminar uh, at the AA last year, about the, the problem of the doer is one of a, a choice of being impotent and free or potent and a slave. And, I, and one senses that in the notion of reticulism or whatever, one's searching for some way to be potent and free. And I'm not sure uh, I've uh, found it. So maybe if Richard could try to knit uh, three presentations, which I think have been more integrated by Sir Jeffrey than all our hours together. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know whether I can knit them together. I think that they they can either they can do their own knitting together in your heads as you see feel appropriate. 
I suppose the, the only sort of thing that I want to say is something about the, the, this idea of the reticulous, the person that fits in the spaces between organizations, um, can have both its positive and its negative aspects. And that something about the uh, hell ecstasy continuum, which I posited before, the, the notion of good-bad, which Tom was talking about, is that there's a that we're all the time individually and institutionally faced with two countervailing needs, that of separation and uh, independence and of relatedness and interdependence. And that um, my sense of it anyway and is that unless one can both acknowledge the good and the bad, the hell and the ecstasy, the, um, the, the positive and beautiful sides of existence in association with the darker sides of existence, that both ourselves or that we will never discover our sense of uniqueness and individuality and integrity, but nor will our institutions. And then I think some of the belly aching, which actually for a, for a moment I got, I thought he's on the wrong track when Sir Geoffrey said it, is something about the anxiety and the difficulty in doing that. And that in a situation where there's uh, enormous range and complexity of institutions which are changing all the time, is that one feels frequently unsupported and uncertain about how you go about doing that difficult task. I want to finish this by reading this uh, another, it's a story of, of Borges, which, as I said, has got the quality of being a parable, or it certainly did to us, and to really leave you that before we go into our small groups to see whether you make any sense of it or not. It's called Everything and Nothing. There was no one in him. Behind his face, even the poor paintings of the epoch show it to be unlike any other, and behind his words, which were copious, fantastic and agitated, there was nothing but a bit of cold, a dream not dreamed by anyone. At first, he thought that everyone was like himself, but the dismay shown by a comrade to whom he mentioned this vacuity revealed his error to him and made him realize forever that an individual should not differ from the species. <coughs> At one time, it occurred to him that he might find a remedy for his difficulty in books, and so he learned the small Latin and less Greek of which a contemporary spoke. Later, he considered he might find what he sought in carrying out one of the elemental rights of humanity, and so he let himself be initiated by Anne Hathaway in the long siesta hour of an afternoon in June. In his twenties, he went to London. Instinctively, he had already trained himself in the habit of pretending he was someone, so it should not be discovered that he was no one. In London, he found the profession to which he'd been predestined, that of actor, someone who, on a stage, plays at being someone else before a concourse of people who pretend to take him for that other one. His histrionic work taught him a singular satisfaction, perhaps the first he'd ever known. And yet, once the last lines of verse had been acclaimed and the last dead man dragged off stage, he tasted the hateful taste of unreality. He would leave off being Ferrix or Tamburlaine and become no one again. Thus beset, he took to imagining other heroes and other tragic tales. <coughs> And so, while his body complied with its bodily destiny in London boarding houses and taverns, the soul inhabiting that body was Caesar, unheeding the augur's warnings, and Juliet detesting the lark, and Macbeth talking on the heath with the witches, who are also the fates. No one was ever so many men as that man, like the Egyptian Proteus who was able to exhaust all the appearances of being. From time to time he left, in some obscure corner of his work, a confession he was sure would never be deciphered. Richard states that in his one person he plays many parts, and Iago curiously says, I am not what I am. The fundamental oneness of existing, dreaming, and acting inspired in him several famous passages. He persisted in this directed hallucination for 20 years, but one morning he was overcome by a surfeit and horror of being all those kings who die by the sword and all those unfortunate lovers who converge, diverge, and melodiously expire. That same day, he settled on the sale of his theatre. Before a week was out, he'd gone back to his native village, where he recuperated the trees and river of his boyhood without relating them at all to the trees and rivers, illustrious with mythological allusion and Latin phrase, which his muse had celebrated. He had to be someone. He became a retired impresario who has made his fortune and is interested in making loans, in lawsuits, and in petty usury. It was in character then in this character that he dictated the last arid statement of his will and testament that we know, 
and from which he deliberately excluded any note of pathos or trace of literature. Friends from London used to visit him in his retreat, and for them he would once more play the part of poet. History adds that before or after his death he found himself facing God and said, I, who have been so many men in vain, want to be one man, myself, alone. From out of a whirlwind, the voice of God replied, I am not either. I dreamed the world the way you dreamed your work, my Shakespeare. One of the forms of my dreams was you, who, like me, are many and no one. plans are as follows. We have then now three sessions starting up, perhaps in the next five minutes or so, and we have the three uh, spaces. Rebecca, can we begin to show people where these spaces are? Now the three sessions... Um, there was a poet in the, the end of the um, 16th century, a young man called Sidney Godolphin, who ended a a poem in about the wonders and limitations of science, oddly enough, was the couplet, to know can only wonder believe, and not to know is wonder see. And Sidney Godolphin was perfectly happy in a world in which wonder was inexhaustible. Uh, four centuries later, Hausmann said that he was a stranger and afraid in a world he never met. Now, I have an uneasy feeling, you know, that there is, we are tend to be bored in potential housemans or potential godolphins. And there really is a difference. Uh, even among see, people like Thomas Hardy, who took up uh, Thomas Hardy with Francis Cornford, two views of life as a difference of light and day, but neither of them could possibly have said, uh, I have stranger and a friend, and well, I never made he belong. I mean, Thomas Hardy belonged as intimately as his tree in his garden, in spite of the somebody we took in the world. So there is this tiresome, um, this tiresome element of personal difference. And when you say us, you see, and we, I'm so aware of this. And each of us here who bothered about this problem, most of us have, yeah, has got his own problems and his own roots, his own sense of where he belongs and his own sense of where he wishes he belonged but didn't. Um, uh, I am really silenced by this, uh, this difficulty. Then there is the awful difference of, of role of what you attach to. Uh, I don't want to talk too much, but I just throw that in. There are two men <coughs> who lived 2,000 years ago, and who are both, each of whom are fairly widely remembered today by one remark. Uh, one was the elder Cato, who started public service at 17 and the Second Punic War, which was the decisive war between Rome and Carthage for the mastery of the Mediterranean. And uh, that law, they finally, Rome finally won. Cato later and visited the remains of Carthage and was appalled to see how prosperous it had become. And although Rome had taken all its colonists and much to fear, he remembered the Battle of Cannes. He never ceased nagging the Roman Senate, they ought to finish the job. And just after he died, they went in and sacked this defenseless city and also to also enslave slavery, everybody in it. Uh, during his lifetime, the other man I thought about, who was a poet called Tellings, wrote a line which humanists will always remember because it's a beautiful humanist motto. He said, I'm a man. Nothing that is human, I deem alien from me. Yeah, I now this man tells that a Carthaginian slave, born in or sold into slavery as a child, was given his Roman citizenship by his Roman master, and with it his name and his name. And between these two wars, he lived a comfortable life. Secure in the world that Cato made and the standing criticism of everything Cato stood for. Now, the world is also divided, see, into Terence's and Cato's. And I have 
counter reluctant to accept that, that uh, <coughs> the folk who run the world are pre selected from a class of folk who are awfully unlikely to be terrorists. And similarly, if you're a terrorist, you're awfully likely to become a case. And I get awfully impatient with terrorists who revile the cases who are doing bad and what they could be doing at all. So the fact remains that here you are. And this tension is not, I think, resolvable. I think it is a basic fact of the tragedy and ambiguity of life. And I think unless you start from the fact that tragedy, ambiguity and pain are given, you don't get anywhere at all. Now, if you can make them significant uh, and therefore bearable, that's fine. But this degree of ambiguity is, is built in. And it's built in between the cases and terminuses as well as between the Gajal and the Hansen. Now, um, let's make a world as bearable as we can for both these, can these categories, and no doubt we can find other ones. Um, let somebody else talk. Well, you, you, um, although, although there are the differences that we look at in many other differences, uh, you yourself seem to imply that nevertheless there's, there's a, a generalized anxiety now, or uh, more of an anxiety to produce the confidence such as the um, about particular kind of circumstances. And, and so when you um, crystallize it in your, sort of your, your graph at the end, um, and you show the human being who's, who's attracted because his relationship with his with, with institution I suppose, is very is very diffused and so that he finds it difficult to find his identity in this. And uh, one sees all sorts of attempts to um, to to say, ah, oh, this is the way out of it. Small is beautiful, we must we must return to smaller society, we must uh, return to to primitive to more primitive we must stop transport all these kinds of ways and attempts to regain something that we seem to have lost in this in, in our state of the process. Well, um, without going back, it would be to be impossible that you can. How would you see us resolving the kind of problem that you that you that you that you chose in your analysis of why it is that we We've got to where we are. How would you see us resolving? I wouldn't think there is one, one <coughs> path of resolution. Um, there are a number. I have a, a grand nephew and a grand niece who just started a commune up at the top of Rochdale. Uh, and good luck to them. Um, yeah, Schumacher has had a plan for progress with small is beautiful and I think they do And uh, you feel that way, and then push more as we push far as it will go. Um, for all I know, indeed I'm sure it will go in, for instance, in housing very much further than I realized. And I missed that conference of Turner's uh, last summer, and was very interested in what he said and want to hear more about it. I don't know how far it will go, uh, but um, let anybody who feels that way push that as, 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 as far as it can. So that I don't think it's a question of, of <coughs> well, finding of a, of a this or that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And incidentally, I think it's also important because there's something built into our minds that tends to make us think binary. Uh, and uh, it's terribly important uh, to try and get over it. I think, it's, I think it really is a built-in thing. Because uh, academics are worse than most people, I think, because uh, uh, they can construct a word that will fit one or side, side of the other. These are your sciences. But we should all try and, 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 uh, and avoid that. And clearly, uh, the building of um, reliable man-sized, thoroughly reliable um, belongings is a key thing. But of course, this results in... Um, uh, criminal gangs, um, um, quite a lot of um, uh, 
obsessively motivated Gaul's supporters who um, um, won't wait for anything or suffer anything and are often nuisance to other people, even those who support their causes. Uh, the thing is, how many uh, loyalties can you take? If you're in fact pushed to a point when the only way you can survive is by making all the world that you a battlefield, well, that's what happened. Uh, but and that made a solution for you. Clearly, the world in which everybody had adopted that solution <coughs> wouldn't last very long. So I think uh, um, yeah, the old, and this is another bit of the human condition, I think, the, the need to combine an infinite tolerance uh, for human difference with a, uh, uh, um, uh, some very tough decisions as to how much difference you can stand is, I think, another part of the human condition. Now, these things, you know, probably nobody here uh, uh, can remember the, um, the um, economic mobilization of this country in 1940. Well, this um, almost, uh, I think I noticed, but certainly without any argument, without even noticing what was doing, which was terribly well done, completely transformed um, this country in the course of five or six months. Indeed, uh, uh, so much so uh, that Britain at the end of that time was much better mobilized than economically and otherwise than Germany was in 1943. You didn't know that because it was one of the greatest mistakes of trying to do economic intelligence. We were always, we subsequently found it in the devil. couldn't believe that. Of course. Now, this happened because there was a manifest obvious change in the external situation. On the other hand, the way people reacted to it was the result of a whole history of learning. I think myself, which will shortly have a, a, a similarly traumatic national situation, which will make which will make belonging to the political, social, fiscal un uh, system of Britain enormously important to people in this island. Um, that will again terrify the longing and will probably uh, greatly reinforce a number of, of um, those who we can to belong to. Um, I think if you were <coughs> learning, I think, remains latent uh, often until some uh, major change triggers it. I mean, it triggers it to find out how much people have learned. And uh, there is no doubt that to live in simple, non conflicting, wholly demanding loyalty patterns is very easy. Uh, you don't have problems of personal identity and that kind of thing. You have battle it's not general. Anyway, not all the battles going on. Um, on the other hand, uh, nobody wants to turn the world into a battlefield just in order to find their own identity. Now here I am, I am wondering. I do not understand why the present state in this country has produced so much identity crisis, a word which was unknown in my use, um, and um, indeed the meaning of which I've only just begun to understand. Um, um, if I live much longer, I might have an identity crisis, but I don't know what it is. I, uh, I can't really see what it is, but I wouldn't have known what it was when I was the age when I was in this room. Now, on the other hand, everybody knows today, and it's very common. And yet the society which people are members are, I think, quite clearly more humane, more sensitive, more egalitarian, uh, more concerned, uh, by almost every measure that I can think of applying. Uh, this is a very challenging factor. I don't know why. Um, except that I think history proceeds in a dialectic way. I think the new beverage, for instance, from Jenna would identify a different set of child evils. Um, and some of them have grown up killing the other lot, because they weren't in there. Some have grown up and trading for them and so on. 
And at these moments of dialectic change, people do tend to be floundering around. I think it's a comfort to think that one's flounderings are possibly a contribution to the solution without you to come out. Who knows what difference a meeting like this makes? We go away, we don't know how to wait differently. To what extent we're changed? We all are. Um, what, what do you see the role of, of media uh, in terms of what we've been talking about this morning? Uh, I know that's a very, very amorphous question, but I find uh, bringing the world into one's living room, you know, whatever, that, whatever that image can mean to the group. Um, I'm painfully puzzled because psychologically I'm, I'm affected because of that fact, because of that thing happening to me, and often not feeling that I, that I have, uh, you know, I relate to it as, as a human being, okay? I am sensitive to these issues. Whether I can do something about them or not, you know, I'm aware of them. So I find, I find it a very, very powerful and often misused. So I'd like to know what you project you know, the role of media in the future uh, in society, not, not too far off, I mean, you know, in the next decade or whatever, how we could be used in a more, um, more meaningful way, maybe to get us to some of these you know, issues or goals that we're struggling with. Well, I'm almost um, too old to have a worthwhile answer because I was. I grew up in a, a, a literate culture where books were run cheap, and everybody was enormously excited about the sense of hope and the working men got together with their masters on Sunday afternoon for the and everything. And, and, uh, but there was no uh, the radio, there was no radio, there was no TV, and there was no radio, 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 there was but an important human being who might otherwise have been great. The really star one was Billy Brown. But I also remember one with Dada Gandhi and one with, um, with uh, uh, um, uh, And uh, for this purpose, and these were, were discussions with a person in which the visual element in the uh, uh, in the exchange was perfectly adjusted. In other words, you were allowed to see the face that you were talking to. You were not constantly on the head or the spot on his tongue or shifting the focus in some other way. Still less way was one other interview I saw was a thing recorded while two people walked single files with thick wood in order to supply some visual image. Was so distracting, you couldn't get a word of what you were saying, although you would really be interesting to chat. Uh, there is obviously an awful built in technological pressure to overwrite, to overdo the visual content. Uh, TV is visio, visio auditory in the minds of its, of its technologists, I think. Not audio, uh, Now, Oh, how you get rid of that idea of that?